good afternoon everyone uh, it's a real pleasure to be here amongst all of you um, well my topic is a very relevant one especially in these times when everything is best done from a distance without having to touch or physically contact anyone or for that matter anything uh, in fact, I would go a step further. I truly believe that COVID-19 pandemic has been an inflection point to bring about a radical change in not only how bankers think about their industry or we focus on some specific industry, but the nation as a whole. It has affected the society at an individual level and is also bringing about changes which are going to stay permanently, thereby becoming the new normal. And one of those changes I believe will be India becoming a more or more cashless society. Uh, the seeds for the required digitization were sown much earlier, and the groundwork that has been done in the past was instrumental in propelling India towards being more and more digitally reliant. Uh, the last decade has shown a decrease in the use of cash in India, and this is likely to continue in the coming years, but uh, I mean, I'll give you some data points later on. But if we turn our eyes to the future, uh, I do believe that India will move to less and less cash, and that will happen soon. It is not far, far away. If you look at what is happening globally, the cash and digital modes have coexisted for decades, despite a robust card payment system. Even the US and China, the world's two largest economies, have a cash to GDP ratio of over 8%. India is way, way higher. But if you look at lessons from some of the Scandinavian countries, like Sweden, Norway, or Denmark, or New Zealand, Cash is fast vanishing. Sweden, for instance, has cash equivalent to less than 1% of its GDP in circulation. Remember, I just said China and Europe is a date. Besides widespread and stable broadband connectivity, what has also worked in favor of some of these countries is high acceptance rates with even small store owners always insisting on digital payments. Sweden today has the most aggressive policy to become cashless. Many Swedish retailers do not accept cash and only 20% of all transactions in Sweden are used, uh, you know, uh, are paid using cash. Uh, and now if you look at, I'll just point to some of the experiments that are being uh, done across the world in trying to create a cashless society. So there are some interesting examples I want to share with you, and they are mind boggling. For example, biohacking is becoming popular in Sweden. Thousands of Swedes have now microchips implanted into their bodies so that they don't need to carry key cards, IDs and even train tickets. The biochip allows them to enter their office, gym or home, home or unlock the computer or smartphone by simply waving the hand in front of it. A, Poli a Polish British startup, Valetmore, has created the world's first microchip implant that can be inserted under the skin and used to make contactless payments at any uh, car terminal. Um, Moscow Metro is planning to launch facial biometric payment. Passengers using the Moscow Metro will be able to pay their fares at metro stations just using face biometrics by end of this year. Uh, so as long as you submit a biometric information, it is possible. In China, Alipay and WeChat are offering facial recognition payments. Uh, and both Alipay and WeChat payment systems are offered by many retailers in the country. Uh, currently, between 16 to 20% of the new POS machines of WeChat, which are called frog machines, users pay with uh, you know, face biometrics. Uh, so in 2018, by the way, a Danish firm called Bikechip released a new generation of microchip implant that is intended to be readable from a distance, not close, distance, and is connected to internet. Uh, and the list goes on and on. So biotech is being radically democratized, much the same way computers were in the 1980s. Implants are only a part of it. In the near future, we may have one inserted microchip in our body, which will act as all in one for identification, for passports, for health data storage, and obviously also as a payment device. So after sharing all that with you, let's look at where India is today. Uh, the Digital India Program, which is a flagship program of Government of India with a vision to transform India into a digitally empowered nation has taken multiple steps in the last few years. And I just want to rush through them because I'm sure all of you are aware so for example, Jam Trinity became the foundation of India's digital governance structure. Uh, India has witnessed numerous schemes that facilitated the public distribution system for people across the country, uh, but the supply chain was broken and there were leakage, leakages worth thousands of crores each year. Uh, rampant inequality was another hindrance to the country's development. 
So with increased digitization in rural areas, and I'm sure you're reading about how BharatNet is, you know, there is an auction on where BharatNet will be rolled out by, uh, you know, uh, contracts given out to, uh, you know, various parties, and a lot of people are bidding for it. Uh, the problem is, how do you connect 1.4 billion people across the length and breadth of the country? And that led to birth of Aadhaar. Uh, then Aadhaar led to opening of Jandhan accounts. Today, India has more than, you know, 40 crore uh, Jandhan accounts and 1.4 lakh crore deposits in those accounts. Mobile phone became the third leg of this jam trinity. Uh, so now with Aadhaar, with the Jandhan accounts and mobile, you can actually bring it all together. And it has helped move distribution of benefits from cash to cashless straight to the account and has obviously now become a foundation for digital governance in India. Today, credit cards and online payment services are becoming popular. In the last one year, from June 2020 till June 2021, UPI, which I'm again sure all of you are aware, based digital transactions have increased by 110% in volume and 109% in value. Uh, during COVID, India was home to the highest number of real-time online transactions in 2020, ahead of countries such as China and the US. This was possible because of the infrastructure that has been created over the last eight to 10 years. For example, even in Access, we are constantly working on improving our mobile apps user experience, strengthening our UPI infrastructure, improving uptime, providing reliable services to our customers, and we can see the results. Today, our mobile app is rated as one of the best apps in the country. So every financial institution starts with looking at the government infrastructure that has been created, then building trust, providing best-in-class user experience to customers. And we are hoping that as that happens, the hesitancy towards digital payments will come down drastically and more and more people will start using it. And once you start using it, it becomes almost impossible for you uh, something else because it is so convenient. It is so easy to do. But then the major question to ask is with India having perhaps the only government created uh, infrastructure for cashless payments, for digital payments, why India is still far behind? And what are some of the big challenges we'll still face which we need to be, which need to be overcome before we get to a cashless society? Uh, Paper-based payments in India continue to occupy a considerable share of 61.4%. Paper currency notes are still an essentially essential part of digital life. India's currency in circulation touched 14.6% of its gross domestic product in 2021, which is higher than 12% that was before monetization. So on, at one side, you can almost say, oh God, we are going in the wrong direction. Um, the reason is around 80% of the working Indians continue to be employed by informal MSMEs. And this sector produces close to 50% of our GDP. And most of these Indians are paid in cash. And don't forget the digital divide still remains huge as more than 40 crore people still don't have any access to internet. Spatial divide is also huge with the inter internet density in rural areas where more than 60% of the people live is still low at 25% compared to the internet density in urban areas, which is 90%. So the digital divide is also big across the leading and lagging regions with states like Bihar and UP having very low internet density. Yeah, and so, you know, this, this digital divide is still very huge. India digital sectors still account for 10% of GDP, which is quite low in compared to some of the emerging economies. While e-commerce revenue has grown exponentially, it still remains 5% of trade in India. Uh, and still, even today, more than 80% of all retail transactions are made in cash. So on one side, while we have seen a massive growth, it, in terms of its market share and overall scheme of things, is still very, very low. And the speed at which we are bridging this gap is also not good enough. And we need to obviously do much more work. So for example, KYC, there's no your customer. Yes, compared to 10 years back, we are much better off. And today we have Aadhaar-based KYC, uh, e-sign. But digital KYC mostly revolves around Aadhaar. And Aadhaar has its own challenges and limitations. It will increase its reach if the customer has multiple digital KYC options, riding on national and state level databases like ration card, electoral data, centers data, et cetera. Regional languages is another problem. Less than 15% of the Indian population speaks English. So there is a huge need to make the content and communication available in regional languages 
that will be understood by a major section of the non-English speaking community. Look at what has happened on the vaccination side. Uh, the worry is that a lot of the people in rural India cannot access the COVID app and, and book uh, you know, themselves for getting vaccinated. Uh, so even in access, for example, when we're looking at this problem, we have realized that we need to be, you know, localize ourselves. And we are already working, for example, on, to make our app and website available in all kinds of regional languages. Then we also need to look at innovation beyond internet and smartphones. Uh, around 50% of the mobile phone users in India are still using feature phones. And that's a very, very large number. So, you know, you can say, yes, internet is reaching rural parts of India and we are going for Bharat Net, but if 50% of the phones are still only feature-based, then we have a problem. So we need to obviously ensure that we can create, Reliance is talking about, for example, to create phones which are smartphones, but available at a cheap price. Uh, something needs to be done about that. Uh, another thing which comes in the way of cashless society is education. Literary rate, literacy rate of India is still at 74%. It means close to 25% of the population is not skilled to participate in any sort of digitization agenda, including digital payments. So we need to find a mechanism to upskill them, to make them part of digital India. Then we need to do handholding and training. Many of those who have access to internet and digital payments are either skeptical about using it or don't know how to use it. So the need of the hour is to train and handhold these people to use you know, the platforms which are available, how to use the app, how do you use the platform, where you can use it, et cetera, et cetera. So for example, in Access, we do multiple customer uh, campaigns on explaining how the apps can be used, website or UPI, and, and also how frauds are being done. So one of the other, problems in, you know, obviously for embracing the digital uh, way of doing things is, is, let's call it in the, under a broad umbrella of cybersecurity. The year 2020 saw one of the largest numbers of data breaches in the world and in India. The total number of brute force attacks against remote desktop protocols jumped from about 1 million during early 2020 to around 3 million mid 2020. By early 2021, the average jumped to about 9 million attacks. So within a span of a year, we have gone from one to 9 million attacks. Uh, hence to truly go cashless, a strong data security architecture is the key enabler and should encompass all the internet, mobile and e-payment technologies. I'm sure you have come across a number of your uh, senior members in your uh, families who are afraid to uh, embrace digital because they might have faced uh, situations where someone tried to, uh, you know, fool them, uh, you know, on the digital infrastructure side, uh, try to fool them in terms of revealing their passwords, et cetera, et cetera. Their mobile phones have been taken over by people who hacked into them and then they have transferred money out. And, and the incidence of this, or the frauds happening because of lack of understanding training uh, is also increasing manifold. And police is not able to go after a lot of these people. I mean, you have seen the web series also around this and one of the OTT platforms. Uh, but yes, the government is very focused on it. Uh, government wants to create a cashless society. Um, uh, IRBI has set the ball rolling for a new umbrella entity for retail payments. So apart from NPCI, they want to create uh, or give licenses to more entities so that more innovation can uh, come to the marketplace. Um, a number of applications have been received by RBI and when hopefully a new license or licenses are given, hopefully more innovation can be brought to the market. And the only way these new companies can make money is to take it to the parts of India, which is not using digital payments today. Uh, so in my view, uh, I truly believe that we are moving in the right direction and inching closer to our dream of a digital India, even as we speak, but there is a lot of ground to be covered for India to become a cashless society. I gave you some insights on where some of the work is required. Uh, had only 10 minutes to speak. So thank you once again for the opportunity to speak here and giving me a patient hearing. Thank you. Very happy to take on some questions if there are. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chaudhary. Yes, you rightly pointed out that, uh, you know, it's a journey which started uh, long back with, uh, you know, Aadhaar and the other initiatives. And during the pandemic, uh, had there been no, uh, you know, systems of cashless payments, we don't even, I mean, we started to uh, understand how good things would have happened. So, you know, a couple of questions that we have got, and we have got a couple of minutes only, but we'll take. Uh, so there's this question, uh, uh, Mr. Chaudhary, which says that, do you think uh, 
uh, that uh, cyber crime uh, regulations and the zeal to move to cashless uh, uh, economy for india is not in sync yes i think you know end of the day uh, the uh, people who you talk about cyber crime the thieves sometimes tend to be ahead of the regulations uh, so and sometimes the regulations need to wait for things to evolve because before you can come out with the right kind of regulations also you might be a bit blindsided if you impose all kinds of rules up front. The cashless part might never take off. The platform might never take off because there are too many rules. So you need to strike the balance. You need to allow for innovation. At the same time, you need to be very, very watchful for misuse of that platform. Uh, we are seeing misuse. We are seeing hackers and people who are uh, you know, taking a lot of people, I mean, educated people for a ride because we are quite vulnerable. Uh, and they know exactly what part uh, what where is the vulnerability and they use that to gain access to our accounts or to our passwords or to our mobile phone and cyber crime obviously is rising and rising rapidly uh, but i think the government is fully seized of the matter and it's not just all the constituents are coming together the banks are coming together the center is coming together there are police forces who are engaging with the banks to see how we can work together to ensure that some of these culprits are caught um, we are making our platforms also tighter. We are coming up with algorithms which catch sudden payments uh, much faster. We stop those payments. Uh, so if someone suddenly starts transferring money out, uh, we allow, might, uh, maybe one might go through, but at the second one, the banks will invariably use their algorithms to start asking more questions, delay it, stop it. Now the banks are also well connected. So ultimately the money moves from one bank account to another bank account. Uh, you know, the whole system is now coming together to ensure that unless cash is taken out, uh, that the money ultimately is lying in some accounts, it can be pulled from there. So yes, uh, the regulation is slightly behind, but they're not working at contradiction. I think they will continue to converge, converge more and more. That does not mean that thieves will remain where they are. They will find new ways to uh, take advantage of the system. But you know, it, it's an evolving mechanism and it's an evolving infrastructure, an evolving scenario. Hopefully, hopefully the incident of frauds and some of those things will come down. Finally, it's the human uh, nature uh, to act vulnerable or become vulnerable very quickly. If people were not, I think some of these things will not happen. Right, right. Uh, Mr. Jodhi, we'll take one more question. So you spoke about that. You know, it's very important to convey in the, uh, uh, with the with uh, uh, customers in their language. And I think and there was always a RBI circular that you know banks need to communicate with the customer. But uh, there's a question that more often than not, it is seen that even uneducated people are given uh, passbooks in uh, languages they do not understand. And also uh, one more question, which I would like to add to it, that you know, even if we, uh, even if we do uh, communicate in the language of their choice, the number literacy problem, do you think that remains, still remains uh, you know, a big hurdle? No, literacy is a problem, as I pointed out uh, very clearly, and I'm talking about 25% of the people are uneducated. The people we are calling educated also, maybe in many ways, a lot of them are uneducated or they're not number literate, as you said. They are not computer literate. They're not you know, apps literate. So in that sense, the portion of population which cannot deal with these applications or these statements is still large. But see, it's a journey. Earlier, they did not have an account. Now they have an account. Now a lot of them have learned how to read those account statements. Or at least they know what balances are and how they can transfer money simply from one account to the other. So more and more population needs to be roped in to open accounts, get comfortable with them, start using the infrastructure. And gradually as uh, you know, UPI has become uh, ubiquitous, uh, you, you know and you see for yourself that a lot of people you never imagined could use apps are using those apps and getting comfortable with it and not getting frauded in the process, right? Uh, so I think things are improving, but it's a journey. And India has a longer journey because of, you know, lack of internet, lack of education, uh, literacy, uh, people being a bit vulnerable and so on and so forth. So uh, it will take time. You have to be patient, but we'll get there. Sir, one last question. Uh, so there's a question. They said that when wallets came, banks were wary of uh, wallets. And now cryptocurrency is here and banks and the government as well seem to be uh, uh, wary about it. Uh, what's your view? Well, the government is wary of cryptocurrency for other reasons, because they believe the cryptocurrency allows uh, people to use that platform to remain anonymous. Uh, and uh, that is something which is not issued by the government of India. So you are ought by the government uh, at large and 
as a result there is an alternate payment mechanism which is existing in the country which the government has no control over which makes them very uncomfortable so uh, rbi and some of the other central banks around the world including china for example are very clear that if there is a digital currency to be issued it will be issued by the central bank rather than someone coming up and and you know starting their own currency but you look at the market cap of all the uh, you know so called bitcoins or cryptocurrency out there it is already very very large a lot of it might be because of speculation but it is an alternate mechanism which is available a lot of people are using it uh, for speculation or for all wrong kinds of things which they want to hide from the governments but it's an evolving uh, you know you know situation i do believe that india has taken a very clear stand that they will not allow uh, cryptocurrency uh, to really survive or to be issued in india they are saying you know obviously supreme court has come out with a judgment saying that it is the right of people to deal in cryptocurrency but i'm sure at some stage a legislation legislation might come out once a digital currency is launched which will restrict the ability to use other cryptocurrencies and make people converge onto the digital currency which are bmi issue and there are very legitimate reasons for doing it. uh mr chaudhary there are many more questions and hope we had time to take all of them but we have run out of time thank you so much for joining us today here it's really pleasure to have you and your views are on the on the on the on the on the fintech and the cashless economy is going to uh, you know help a lot of people who are attending here